Whatever was popped back in the head. Drag, 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 drag,
watching is show footage from the show that I was working with, uh, with Trolley for about 10 years. That's one of the, actually eight years, close to 10 years. That's one of the Cirque du Soleil shows and we had the joy of traveling all the way around the world many times. And uh, so what I've done is I've collected a lot of examples and I've collected a lot of experiences in those travels and I'd like to share them with you. And I'd like to take you on a trip around the world I'm going to take you to other lands right here inside this room. Hi, welcome. Hi. Uh, by the way, did everybody get one of these forms? Everybody has one? Yep. Okay, great, thanks. We have to give those in. That's how I get my little parking seat back. Um, uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I've been a professional musician and an educator most of my life. Uh, I graduated college way back in 93. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> And I've been performing and teaching ever since. And as I said, uh, working with the Cirque, we managed to work around the globe about three or four times. From all the way from California to, to China <laughs> or Japan. And so I didn't do the Australian tour, but uh, we've, we've been all the way around. And, uh, Right now I work in Montreal, I live and work in Montreal. I finished my time with the Cirque about two years ago, three, I think this is uh, January. And I was working on the traveling show. There are the, the fixed shows, but it's all pretty much the same world music type concepts. And in working, hi, welcome, come on in, have a seat. And by the way, friends, this is a, this is a very informal setting. You know, you see how many people here we have here, so we can just have fun. This is an open dialogue, so if you have questions, please just, you don't even have to raise your hand, just ask out. I've got a lot of music that I want to share with you today, but it's not essential that I get through all of it. I'm more interested in dialogue and talking about some of the things that we're going to uh, talk about today and seeing how they can actually have an impact on you and what you can actually do with it in your classroom. That, that part of the presentation, what's it doing in my classroom, is kind of a because everything that we're doing here is hope, going to hopefully have some kind of an impact on our students in the classroom. So throughout the presentation, you're going to find a lot of little link points where you can jump off and go someplace else. Like for instance, when we talk about uh, Calypso music, when we talk about uh, slaves, well, that's part of, uh, that's part of uh, 
history. So you can even use this music as an inroad to take you to a discussion on slave trade or something like that. So you're going to see those types of links all throughout this entire presentation. Um, <clears throat> Goals of this workshop, we're going to discuss some of the misconceptions of world music. We're going to try to increase our knowledge of a variety of music styles and instruments from all over the world. <coughs> and once again, we're going to try to take some of these samples and ideas and see how we can bring them into the classrooms. Uh, oh, can you hear me OK or do I need to turn this on? OK, I need to sign. Just by a show of hands, who is from someplace else other than Canada? Or who has parents from someplace else other than Canada? Okay, one, two, three, four. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine people in this room right now, and four of us are from someplace else. This is an example of what we're seeing in our classrooms. If you notice in your classrooms, they're more diverse. We have Indian students, we have Japanese students, Chinese students, Korean students, Spanish, uh, Mexican, uh, Haitian, all the way, runs the entire gamut. So what I did, what I've noticed, there's 196 countries in the world today, and in Canada, 33 ethnic groups with at least 100,000 members each. Now, if you multiply 33 times 100,000, and then try to take that statistic, bring that into our classroom. It just represents exactly what we're seeing. Since 1989, there's an average of 210,000 permanent residents every year. So when I was teaching uh, last year at Hampstead, uh, just, in my, just in the music classes, I was getting Korean students all year long. By the end of the year, I had about eight or nine Korean students that had just come off the boat, just straight into the classroom, and they're just, boom, dropped into the classroom. Some of them don't speak English very well, they had language classes, and they were just kind of dropped on me. I don't speak Korean, so uh, one of the fun things that we had to do was I had to learn about Korean music, so just to kind of share with them in some format. One of the ways that we can use music is to try to open an inroad into a student's culture something that they're familiar with, whether you're discussing math or whether you're discussing uh, history or anything else, we can use that music as an inroad to kind of get through their defenses, kind of, and kind of try to trick them into learning. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm going to say true or false, and then you have to say true or false, okay? Misconceptions. All music outside of the U.S. is world music. True or false? False. False. And by the way, I'll make it easy for you. It says misconception at the top. So. <laughs> Fusion music is world music. That means if I put a pair of bongos on a rock and roll track, does that make it world music? False. All world music comes from outside of the United States. True or false? Only Irish people like Celtic music. Are you Irish? No. Do you like Celtic music? I love Celtic music. I like any kind of music. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, True or false? World music is not popular. False. True or false? White people cannot play world music. <laughs> so some of this stuff is just some of this stuff is just crazy and it's obvious, right? But this, these are true misconceptions. I like the socks. Welcome. I'll 
finish the presentation right now and tell you what world music is. World music is a commercial label that we try to categorize things in. Thank you. Goodbye. That's it. <laughs> That's what world music is. World music is exactly that. It's just a label. That means that some record executives, some place, were trying to figure out why these uh, uh, albums were selling so well in these other countries but there was no market for it here in the United States. Well, I say here, we're in Canada, I'm American, so I'm like, I keep saying things like that. So what they found was that they, there was an entire untapped market, but they didn't have a name for it. So what did they call it? They decided to call it world music. That means that anything that we come up with now, anything that, um, that we create, that doesn't fit into rock and roll, that doesn't fit into classical music, that doesn't fit into yada, 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 and all these other different forms, will immediately get grouped into world music. And that's, that just happens. So any of your favorite artists that you would never assume would be in world music, you may find their stuff in world music. You might go over here to the classical band and try to find Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar is an Indian classical musician. It should be classical music, right? not in the United States. But if you go to India, is world music world music in India? Of course not. It's just like if you go to China. If you're in China, are you going to go out for Chinese food? You know, you're just going to go out and eat. It's just food that happens to be in China. Or if you're in Italy, you go out for pizza or pasta. Is that the same thing as going out for Italian food? Of course not. It's just home cooking, wherever you are. This is why world music is such that, just a label. Because anywhere else, it's not a label. If you listen to bluegrass music in Ireland, bluegrass music from the United States, blues from the United States, jazz from the United States, technically would be considered world music. But it's not world music where I come from. That's just music that we play at home. So how do we get down this road of world music? We can blame this guy. Remember what I said about white people not playing uh, playing world music? This is this guy looks like one of the whitest guys that I've ever seen or known. He's from Clinton, New York, and he's very important. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Once again, everybody has one of these sheets, right? Um, this is Dr. Robert E. Brown. He's no longer with us but he's done some important work in ethnomusicology. Dr. Brown uh, attended UCLA, and he got his uh, doctorate degree from UCLA way back in around 1961. In 1961, he moved and began teaching at Wesleyan, uh, at Wesleyan University. While he was there, he developed a concert series. He also developed the world music and uh, musicology program, ethnomusicology program there at Wesleyan University. What it does is it exposes the students to world music and teaches them how to teach, perform, understand, learn. Now, ethnomusicology is a little bit different. Ethnomusicology is more like history. Ethnomusicology deals with uh, the culture that the music comes from and more, more than just the music. So if we were taking an ethnomusicology approach to this, uh, to this discussion today, we'd be talking about Peruvian people in the village and walking down the little road, how they get from one place to the other, and the course of their normal day life, and what they're wearing. We're not going to go that deep into discussion today. Unfortunately, we're going to take a cursory glance at a lot of things. So we're not going to get into anything in any true depth, but we're going to try to get as much as we can done today. So once again, uh, Dr. Brown, he founded a concert series, and so what he did was he brought in a dozen performers from Asia and Africa to perform right there at Wesleyan University. So now these are people that have never seen uh, performers from other lands, or maybe they even haven't even heard of music from other lands. One of the other things that Dr. Brown did is he went to Indonesia and made a series of recordings. The recordings that he made in Indonesia became the first widely distributed uh, recordings of Indonesian music within the United States. So this guy is pretty important. He's the guy that kind of opened that envelope for world music. <laughs> 
He also founded. He also founded the Center for World Music in San Diego, California. In 1971, Dr. Brown moved to San Diego and began teaching at San Diego State University. While there, he developed a program that, once again, as he did at Wesleyan University, bringing those artists from all over the world into his own, his own city, his own area. He brings in master artists from all over the world to teach K-12 students, to interact with them and share what they know with these students. These are 9 through 12th graders. So you guys are learning it like this.
to know more about the Center for World Music, I encourage you to check out their website. They've got a, a lot of really nice programs and a lot of nice programming for, for the schools. We're going to talk about Indonesian gambling. This is the first place that we're going to go on our little trip. We're going to go around the world. Uh, the Indonesian gambling, I want to read this off the card because I don't want to mess it up, okay? So I want to be kind of detailed. The Indonesian's music history can be traced all the way back to the third century. It's a mix of Indian, Arabian, and Asian styles. Out of the entire nation, including more than 17,000 islands and hundreds of different styles of music, the most popular is the gamelan. In Indonesian, the word gamelan means to hit or strike, and is an ensemble of approximately 15 mostly metallic percussion instruments and a few flutes and things here and there, but mostly uh, metallic instruments that you see there. So the gamelan is actually is an actual ensemble. It's not an instrument. It's an ensemble. Gamelan music is often repetitive or cyclic in nature, which means that the same rhythms and melodies are often used over and over again and are indicated by the strikes of the gong. You're going to see those gongs. You see that gong right there in the back? It's a big horizontal, uh, big vertical gong. We've seen those before. The one we might not be familiar with is this one right here. This is the horizontal gong. Okay, I'll cut this second. Some people believe the gamelan can lead the mind into a deep trance and help with meditation. Now, interesting, interestingly enough, one of the people that was influenced by gamelan music. <coughs> was Claude Debussy. And you can hear that in his music. Now, I had never considered Claude Debussy a world musician, but in 1889, he attended the World's Fair and he saw the Japanese gamelan for the first time. It influenced him so much, he just stayed there for hours and hours just listening to the music. When he got back, he ended up composing using those five note scales. What do we call a five-note scale? Pentatonic scale, right? If you listen to some of Claude Debussy's music, one of the one of the identifying characteristics of his music is the five-note scale. You can hear that. Now, we're going to hear that. <laughs> It's not random. It's not random. 
but it's truly, it's a melody. They're gonna develop that melody the way that they want it to sound. And we're gonna see, we're gonna see this concept over and over and over again in a lot of different types of music. We're gonna talk about that when we get to Indian music also. Creating a melody is exactly that. It's so simple. You sing a melody. How many times have you caught yourself just singing some silly little something that, you know, that just popped into your head that may not be anything you recognize? Well, you just composed a melody. And if you have the if you have the construct of five notes or seven notes, pick something that sounds good. We're talking about tone duration, we're talking about rhythm. That's it. Tone duration and rhythm. That's the basic so construct. It's based solely on Improvisation is creating constantly. Composing is improvising and then keeping, <laughs> if, you, if you want to take it that way. Because improvising is con continually developing. Oh yeah, the bamboo flute that you heard there is the surly. Uh, the interesting thing about all this world music that you're that we're listening to, you're going to see a lot of similarities. Remember the way. Let's see. I want you to. I want you to memorize <coughs> that instrument right there. It's a bamboo flute. Has holes in it. You blow in it from one end. It looks kind of like a recorder, right? Calypso music. These are the West Indies. The West Indies uh, are composing. You've got Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, uh, the Dutch, uh, the, the Dutch uh, Antilles, and Curacao, all of that stuff. All of that's West Indies. That's Columbus's fault, by the way. Hey, how you doing? This is you. Mm -hmm. From West Indies. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's Columbus's fault because he uh, got lost. Um, I'm going to read this also from the current because I've got something specific. Uh, the most popular music style among the West Indies was brought over by African slaves about 200 years ago. Remember, we talked about looking for those links in the classroom. Here's your inroad to talking about slave history. Uh, forbidden from speaking to one another. The, slave, the slaves developed music that they could sing to one another. And as they were singing, they were conveying information. And so they were communicating through song. Now this is not so unusual, because you have to remember that these slaves are mostly from Africa. Using music for communication, that's, that's just rote. That's how uh, they speak from over wide distances, using log drums. And we're also going to see one of those later on. So, singing to one another using the style they've developed the types of music. One of the most popular songs that we're familiar with, what's the most popular song that you can think of from the West Indies? What is it? <laughs> the most popular song pretty much ever from the West Indies by the Mr. King Calypso himself, Harry Belafonte. Now, did Americans in 1957 know that they were listening to world music? No, but they heard this kind of funky little rhythm that they kind of got, right? They immediately like it. Kids immediately get this song. They just get it. I don't know why, they just get it. Six foot, seven foot, eight foot bunch. I did this with my uh, third grade. And, and my kindergarten. steel drum. Everybody's familiar with a steel drum or the steel pan. This 
steel drum comes to us sometime between 1930s and 1945, somewhere around the end of World War II. Why World War II? I'm going to tell you the legend of the steel drum. During World War II, rationing, right? There were not a lot of uh, metal products because everything was being used for the war. So, imagine you're in the West Indies. Well, I don't know if you can imagine it, but just think. I'm going to tell you, you're in the West Indies. And you're playing cricket. British colony, right? So you're playing cricket. And one of the balls hits the trash can lid. It dents it, right? Well, you can't have a dented trash can lid, so you got to get it fixed. So they take the trash can lid, and then they start hammering out the, hammering out the dents in the trash can lid, right? As they're hammering the lid, tones are produced. Ah, idea. So what they did, they went and found other trash can lids, started denting them on purpose, and as they hammered around the trash can lids, they found that they could actually produce specific tones from the way that they actually created the size and the placement of the dimple that they put in the head. So they were able to actually create specific tones. This gave us a chromatic scale. So, there weren't a lot of trash can lids, as you can imagine. But what they did have was an overabundance of 55-gallon oil drums. Why? Because West Indies is an oil-producing area, so they've got plenty of uh, oil drums. So they took these oil drums and found that they could get the same effect and they could control it more. So oil drums became uh, ideal for that. Also, when the Americans pulled out of the West Indies, the, uh, the American forces pulled out of there, they just left all their trash behind. A whole bunch of oil drums and fuel drums, right? So they used them. They created the steel van. The steel van. See how happy everybody is? Steel drum just makes you happy. I'm so happy this makes you happy. Maybe that's why kids just get it. F sharp. This is another instrument that kids just get. They get it. C sharp. F sharp. G sharp. What do you think those white marks are? B flat. F sharp. D. music from all around the lands, we think, we, we don't really listen to it, and we don't really envision ourselves trying to actually play that instrument. But you have to remember, every instrument, every musical instrument is approachable. It's accessible. It's, if they can play it, then you can play it. We can play it. There's a logic behind everything. You just saw the logic right there. It's not a whole, just an empty, you know, just a, a, a metal garbage can with a bunch of dents in it. No, it's an actual musical instrument that has notes. And if you recognize that, then you can tap out a very simple melody. And the more you practice, the better you can get at it. Guitar. I'm going to teach you all how to play guitar in 30 seconds, just now. Think about it. Just think about it. The guitar has six strings on it, right? Each string is tuned to a different note, right? How do you change the pitch on a guitar string? You move your finger on it, right? You press it down to make it shorter or longer. What do we learn about, what do we learn about uh, 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 notes? 
when it comes to shorter and longer pitch. The longer that a note is, or longer that something is, it's going to give you a lower sound, right? The shorter something is, it's going to give you a higher sound, right? It's the same logic all over the instrument. If you start with one string, then you're like, oh yeah, I can play a little tune on one string. Well, then you do that on the next string, and then you do that on the next string. And then you try to pick out notes together. I didn't say it would be easy to learn the guitar. I just said that I could teach you how to play the guitar. So now, I've taught you all how to play the guitar and how to approach the guitar. Now it's up to you to actually do the all, the all the hard work that it takes to actually learn how to play it, right? So every instrument has a logic behind it. Everything is approachable. You just saw those kids <coughs> playing, playing those uh, gamelan instruments. I, I never considered playing gamelan instrument, but I never thought about it before. But here you have third graders playing perfectly fine melodies on instruments from across the world. So where are we going next? Ah, Turkey. The bridge between the East and the West. And when I say that, I literally mean there's a bridge between the East and the West. Uh, I went to Istanbul. And right here in Istanbul, you've got Istanbul on one side and you've got Uskudar. I don't know how to pronounce that. But you see those two black points right there? There's literally uh, a bridge that crosses the water there. Everything over there, on that side, that's uh, Europe. Everything on the other side of that bridge is Asia. So you can imagine what the Turkish influence for music can do. They're going to be pulling from both sides of the world, literally. So you can hear that in music. That's me. Now, remember, one of the things I wanted you to do is I wanted you to think about the instruments that you're hearing and compare them to other instruments from other places. You're going to see a lot of comparisons. A lot of similarities. Again, I want you to remember this instrument. Remember our bamboo flute? And I want you to remember this instrument. Zorna. It is a reed instrument. It's actually a double reed instrument. It's like an oval. But this is not the only time you're going to see this instrument. You're going to see it again in a few minutes. Someplace else. You've got the baglan up there. Kind of a guitar type instrument with three strings. You've got the, the kumanji, which is a violin type instrument that you actually put on your lap and you drag a bow across the string. You play it like a cello, but it sounds high like a violin. You're going to hear that in a minute. Uh, you've got the darbuka. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a goblin shaped instrument. It's a percussion instrument. And the name, the bamboo, the bamboo flute that I told you about. Hello, welcome. So, this is your Baglama. Yeah, well, he's a very good guy. The Harry and I can play the heck out of this. else I want you to recognize. Do you hear that drone on the bottom? Da, 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 da. I'm going to talk about that in a minute too. See, it's easy to play the guitar. Just make the string shorter and longer. It's got three strings. Only three strings. That's a metronome. Yeah. Apparently he's bored. So do you recognize guitar technique? You've seen those flashy guitars, electric guitars? Same technique. Same technique, yeah. What about Bakrama? Uh, because I, I lived in Greece for a few 
few years, I used to play in Greek music for like three years, to be honest, from 87 to 90. And the uh, extension of bak baklama is buzuki. In Greek. Exactly. So, yeah. Yes. So if you go to Greece, it's basically the same thing. Same instrument. But, but there is four strings. Oh, oh sorry. Four strings. Four strings. Four strings. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you look very closely, you do see the three strings, but it's actually six strings. It's just like a, a like a 12-string guitar. It's six strings, you've got a big string and a little string right next to each other. What you're doing is you're playing one string, but both strings are vibrating or resonating. So that's what's giving you that high, low sound. And that's what you're doing there. Come on in! Come on in! Welcome. Okay. This is the come in key. Street guy. Now, I want you to notice, this is just a guy playing on the street. First of all, listen to the sound of the instrument. Remember when I mentioned that it sounds like a violin? It's just a different tuning.
Algeria. All together. Feet of flames. <laughs> <laughs> He's the Lord of the dance. <laughs> so here's the deal. He's American. Michael Flatley is American Irish. And so what happened back in 1981 uh, for a Eurovision contest, uh, a song was used. A song was written. It was a seven minute musical. And the, set, the name of that seven minute musical was Riverdance. So Flatley found out about it. I don't know, maybe he, I don't know, maybe he was there or something, I don't know. But the point is he knew about it. And so what he did was he took that seven minutes, and the original seven minutes are just ballet dancers. But in 94, he came up with like a 90-minute show of this, of what you just saw, using this music. Now what happens here is this creates excitement. And then a big show like this, just like the show I was touring with, it's going to go everywhere. This show was all over the planet. Michael Flatley was earning $1.9 million a week. Okay? Okay? Maybe call him more. Now, I can't even fathom that. $1.9 million a week, that's just ridiculous. The man insured his legs for $40,000 each. What? Sorry, what did you say? He, he insured his legs. He had, his his yeah. legs had, uh, had insurance. That's not so new. I think, uh, yeah. who was it? Well, uh, Sid Charisse or Tina Turner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done that stuff before. But that, that's just, I'm not going to say ridiculous. It's just, it, it's just different. It's just different. So what it does is it, it created an excitement for Irish and Celtic music all over the world. So lots of people in places that they've never heard Irish music, but that Celtic dancing came to them and created excitement for them. So people are talking about Irish music. So everybody's like, oh, I love Irish music. And every time we go, every time we hear about St. Patrick's Day, well, at least in, in the United States, I don't know about in Ireland, but in, what's that? Not really a big thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. See? So, well, that's the time that we truly hear our Irish music. We see our little leprechauns dancing around and everything. I don't really know how the Irish feel about leprechauns, but <laughs> I'd love to hear from them. Um, some of the instruments that you're going to see for, our, uh, for Irish music, again, look very familiar. The bazooki, as we, were, as we were talking about. He said the bazooki he saw was in Greece. Here we see the bazooki in Irish music. And remember, it looks like the Baglama, right? Oh yeah, look. Another bamboo flute with the six holes and the blow in it. Which again, also looks like a tin whistle. Tin whistle is constructed the same way. Once again, it also looks like a recorder, which we use in our classrooms. You've got the fiddle, which is a violin. It's just kind of a smaller version of the violin. And you've got these things. Anybody ever heard of the Julian Pipes before? The Julian Pipes are like bagpipes. No, no, they are bagpipes. There's a bag, there's air, and it creates sound through a reed. Bagpipes. And then you have the bottom, which is the 10 inch to 26 inch uh, frame drum. You see the frame in the back. 
and you sit and you put it on your lap and you hold this stick here. This stick has a beater on both sides of it. And you play it like this. And that's how they get all those punchy rhythms. And it sounds all that just from one single drum. One guy, one drum. You ever heard of the Chief Things? There's our fiddle on the left. And those are your Julian pipes there in the back of your bottom. There's the acoustic guitar creating that note. That's so unusual.
we saw drum sets, which the and the beat comes from the West, like uh, like the Americas. Uh, you saw bongos. The bongos are a Latin America instrument. So just in this group, we see a lot of fusion. So let's move on. Indian music. Oh, yeah. What is it about Indian music that just sounds so Indian? Yeah. that you composed the melody. We've heard that before. 
of Indian melodic ornamentation. Indonesian five to seven notes, Lindro, I think it is because your music is now we're in India. Again, five to seven notes that the melody is going to come from. Again, how do we make it approachable to our kids? Same format. Choose a limited amount of notes. Five to seven divided three to And let them go. Each of the song he produces it has, has a separate Cobble. sound server. Yes. This is how we teach our students also, and it can be written down. You know, our whole uh, system is a oral tradition, it's yes. not a written down yes. system. That's why it's alive. Yeah. So, uh, while we teach a tabla student, we have to use a certain sound syllabus. Like each uh, sound produced with the hand has a separate word for it, like this. Ta. Tin. Okay. He just sang that, and he just played exactly what he sang. He just played exactly what he sang. Remember, just because you hear it, and it sounds amazing, remember, there's a logic behind everything. All that fast playing, each finger is a drumstick. You do that all the time. You're drumming your fingers. You're doing the same thing. He's just trained longer. You're doing the same thing. You saw those kids, those third graders at the beginning at the Center for World Music. They were playing on the top. Alright, I think we get the point. Let's go on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about fusion. George Harrison. George Harrison, for those of you that do not know, was from a very famous band a long time ago. They were called the Beatles. You ever heard of those guys? No, you ever heard of the Beatles? Okay. George Harrison fell in love with Robbie Chopper and so what he did was he invited Ravi Shankar to come with him, and they brought his music into theirs. This is a song that we're, most of us are familiar with, but you never notice that there is a sitar in there. There it is. Turkish. But remember, we 
saw a drum like that before. Remember, it's all, there's a, there's a fusion of cultures here. This is Kwame. So the sitar is a wooden, hollow, a, a, a hollow wooden instrument with 23 strings of which only six or seven are actually played. Okay, let's move on. We're talking about Spanish music. Can anybody in here flamenco dance? I took lessons when I was in uh, Sevilla. I still can't do it. <laughs> I, learned, I learned about the rhythm. This is uh, the, the beat from a rhythm. This is 12 beats.
Yeah, she's sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Look, friends, we're running real tight on time. We're gonna have to skip ahead. Uh, there's just so much. To Pablo Garcia, most amazing flamenco guitarist. Please check him out. Go on YouTube, find him. He's amazing. Uh, the, 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 the Spaniards deem him a national treasure, and I mean that literally. They 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 had a a decree, like we decree you a national monument, a national treasure. Amazing, amazing. Chambao. Spanish fusion. Flamenco top jazz. Desire. 
it's five tone, it's five, five beats. It's either two, three, which is makes us move because it's creating a constant tension release, tension release, tension release. This is why you feel, you feel that, you know, when, when, you, when it really gets you. Are we done? Yes, I'm Oh, come on in. Come on in. So, everybody do it. Three, two, one, two, ready, go. Thank you so much. Yeah, please take one of my flyers with you. How much do they pay you for your phone? What's that? Is that how much do they pay you for your phone? I think it's actually kind of priceless. Uh, you can leave your leave your comment sheets right up here on the corner, please. And uh, you can take one of the flyers. <laughs> 